Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And uh, I'm gonna do a little, little more than the non-introduction introduction, just because I'm adding a couple things, <laughs> a couple of topics that we touched on at least a little bit. But uh, we need to go into more detail on as we go. When we get started, we're going to be starting with the book of Zephaniah. And uh, tonight we're probably going to get through the last four because they're all pretty short. The last four of the book of the twelve, as it's called because they're all in one scroll, or the minor prophets as they're sometimes called because of the shortness of the books. And those are Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. <laughs> Good sign. Um, so, it, uh, just for in terms of orienting ourselves, in terms of where we are in the Old Testament, once we finish those, all we're going to have left in the Old Testament is Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, plus what's called the Paralipomenon Jeremias, which means Jeremiah's leftovers, which. <laughs> We do translate it literally, which are some other books related to the book of Jeremiah. But basically, it's just going to be those four prophets, and they're much longer books. So we're looking at first year. No, probably it's going to take it. Like Isaiah has uh, like sixty-seven chapters. Whoa! For example, so we look a little bit long. So we're looking at more like next summer. You know, I think yes. next next summer we're going to be finishing the Old Testament. Yeah. Just put that on the tape and encourage them to come. Yeah. <laughs> Then we'll be getting into the New Testament. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do, in addition to, again, I'll say, if you want to listen to the introduction to the prophets, it's on the, uh, you can go on the website and go to the Sunday Night Bible Study and go to the first one on the prophets, which is on Hosea. And that has my big, long, dull introduction. You can listen to that if you want to hear it again. Um, but in, in addition to that, I wanted to... to take a moment and touch back on something I talked about in that original introduction now that we've read some some prophetic books because one of the main points I tried to make in that introduction is that uh, the way we typically think about prophecy when someone talks about prophecy or a prophet in in American in our American culture is not really what prophecy means in terms of biblical prophecy Right, I said, when someone comes to you and talks and asks about prophecy, we usually think of either predicting the future, right? That's a big one, someone who can predict the future, or uh, someone who has strange visions, right? And we're going to get to strange visions later on. <laughs> but in terms of prophecy, we said in biblical terms, in biblical terms, what prophecy is, is a prophet, and this goes back to Deuter at the end of Deuteronomy, God says, don't go to diviners and don't practice witchcraft and, and astrology and all this stuff to try to figure out the future. Right? He says, I'm going to send you a prophet, and that prophet is going to call you back to Torah, to his teaching, to what I've already told you, to what I've taught you, to what I've revealed to you. Right? And that's going to tell you how you need to live your life. You don't need to predict the future. <laughs> Right? You, could, this, you know how you ought to be living your life and what you ought to be doing. So now that we've read a few prophetic books, right, on one level you could say, well, when Obadiah comes to Edom, or Nahum comes to, comes to the Assyrians, and he says, God's judgment is coming and you're going to be destroyed. In one sense you could say, okay, well he's predicting the future. But in another sense, all he's doing is telling them the same thing God told them all the way back in Deuteronomy, which was, I set before you life and death, blessings and curses. If you choose this path, you will live and you will receive blessings. If you choose this path, you will receive curses and destruction. Right? So he's just coming and telling them what they should already know. <laughs> right? He's not giving them some new prediction of the future. And so this gets into what we talked about, this idea that 
we having the Holy Spirit, when we're going through the book of Joel, that we having the Holy Spirit are all called to be prophets. If your friend is cheating on their spouse and you find out about it, and you go to them and say, man, you're on the wrong, you're on the wrong road with this. You need to stop. If you don't, you're going to destroy your marriage, you're going to destroy your life, right? You're going to separate yourself from Christ, you're going to separate yourself from this church. This is the wrong road to go down. You don't need to be able to predict the future, (laughs) right, to tell him that, right? You know that that's the truth because (laughs) that's what God's told you, that's what God's promised you. So, when, when... we're told that with the Holy Spirit we're all called to be prophets. It doesn't mean we're all called to have strange visions. It doesn't mean we're all called to be able to predict the future. Right? It means we're all called in whatever circumstances we are, in our families, with our friends, a place of employment, our country, wherever we are, to speak the truth of what God has taught us to those around them and tell them the truth about what they're doing and its consequences and to call them back to call them back to the way they're supposed to be living and the way things should be so this is what I meant in that introduction when I mentioned somebody like Martin Luther King Jr. as being someone who had a prophetic voice I don't know that he had any mystical experiences at any point in his life but what he did in the United States was, he looked at the way the country was living its life and said, this is wrong. This is evil. And he stood up and he said so at the cost of his life. And he said, this is not the way things should be. That's the kind of prophetic voice we're called to, we're called to have. And just like with the prophets, the main reason we usually avoid that is that it makes us unpopular. Right? Just like it made the prophets very unpopular. This is why Christ says to us, you know, one of the promises he makes to us is, if they hated me, meaning Christ, they will hate you. Right? And you should rejoice when they do because that's how they treated the prophets who came before you. Right? They hated them, they killed them. So that's the note I wanted to make on prophecy. Next note I want to make is on apocalyptic. Now, apocalyptic, James asked me if it was an adjective. <laughs> that's, how we usually, that's how we usually hear it used. Right? Apocalyptic meaning like it's like the end of the world. Right? <laughs> you know? That's, that's not strictly speaking what it means. We have to reorient our terms a little bit. Uh, where that use comes from is that the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, is in Greek, the Apocalypsis, which means the Revelation. <laughs> what was revealed to St. John. Okay. And so people will now call things apocalyptic because they see Revelation as being primarily about the end of the world, which we'll discuss when we get there in a few years. <laughs> whether that's really what it's primarily about. But, so use it that way. But apocalyptic is really a type of literature. It's a type of literature. And the book of Revelation, at the end of the New Testament, is one example of that type of literature. But there's all kinds of apocalyptic literature. There's apocalyptic literature that's outside the Bible. And there's apocalyptic literature that's inside the Bible in the Old Testament. Tonight we're probably going to read our first piece, and that's going to be in the book of Zechariah. Not Zephaniah, but Zechariah. <laughs> we get there in a couple of books. It's apocalyptic literature, and when we get to the parts of Ezekiel are, uh, and most of the book of Daniel is apocalyptic literature. So what does that mean? <laughs> well, apocalyptic again comes from apocalypsis, a Greek word that means revelation, something being revealed. The idea being something being revealed that was previously hidden. So it was hidden or unknown that's now being revealed. And so what happens in apocalyptic literature 
I'll use an example from outside the Bible that we've talked about. That's the book of First Enoch. Uh, book of First Enoch. Enoch, remember who walked with God and was no more. The book of Genesis. So the book of First Enoch. Enoch, when he's taken up to heaven, he sees sort of the history of the world, and he sees what heaven is like. It's revealed. These things are revealed to him, and then he shares them in in the book. That's the same idea that we're going to see in these other examples of apocalyptic literature. The idea is that a person, a person is taken to heaven, is taken into God's presence. And in God's presence, they see what's going on on earth, both at the present time and in history and in the future. They see what's going on on earth from a different perspective, from God's perspective. And so the purpose of that type of literature is, for example, the book of Revelation, to telegraph a little bit. The primary purpose of the book of Revelation is to give comfort to early Christians who are already being killed for being Christians. Because from their perspective, they're trying to follow Christ and they're getting massacred. So St. John is taken into Christ's presence and has this vision and sees what's going on from another perspective from God's perspective. And so he shares that perspective with them in order to give them a better understanding and hope in terms of what's going on. And this is what we're going to see in Zechariah. Zechariah is going to write to the the Jews right after they've returned, after the, the exile. The Persians have allowed them to come back and rebuild Jerusalem. And remember we read about Nehemiah having to stand in the spaces in the wall Right with the men, they have a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other trying to build. So they're constantly under attack from raiders. Well, they're in a pretty dire situation. And Zechariah is going to go into God's presence. He's going to see what's going on from another perspective. He's going to share that perspective with them so that they can understand what's really going on. What's really going on in the world at that time. So when we talk about apocalyptic, that's what we're that's what we're primarily talking about is that type of literature. And uh, as we hit Zechariah tonight, and then once we get into Ezekiel and Daniel, we'll talk more about it, obviously. Um, but it's important to know that's a slightly different type of literature than the typical the typical prophetic book we've been reading, which is basically. Uh, a verbal pronouncement from a prophet right saying you know pronouncing judgment this is a little different (laughs) and then third third topic to touch on before we go is eschatology which uh, comes from the Greek word eschaton which means the end so this discussion concerning the end or the last things Again, this is usually used in the context of the, of the end of the world. But again, doesn't mean just that. Doesn't mean just that. Um, within, uh, now we've discussed apocalyptic. Within the realm of apocalyptic, there's this idea when the, when the, the person is taken to the presence of God, as I said, they write about not just what's going on at the time from God's perspective, but human history and the future, right? Because from God's perspective, he can see all these things, right? The whole, the whole is clear from God's perspective, right? And so eschatology really has to do with uh, the study of the last things, the study of the things that are to come from that perspective. So, for example, in the liturgy, in the liturgy, uh, right after the epiclesis, which is the, the prayer that uh, usually Father, Father Scott says, he turns on his mic, right, so that everyone can hear that one, where we call upon the Holy Spirit to descend upon the gifts. Okay. Uh, 
uh, shortly after that, right, he lifts up, he lifts up the uh, the chalice and the the paten, right, and right before he does that, the prayer that we say is calling to remembrance all those things that have come to pass for us, the cross, the grave, the resurrection on the third day, the ascension into heaven, the sitting at the right hand. And your second and glorious coming. Well, wait, how can we remember? <laughs> how can we remember Christ's second coming? Last I checked, it hasn't happened yet. Right. That and that's what we call. We say that the liturgy is written from an eschatological perspective. Meaning, when we're celebrating the liturgy, we're celebrating it with with. Christ, we're celebrating it with the angels, we're celebrating it essentially in the kingdom of God. Right. And from that perspective, from that perspective, sees the whole thing. Our whole salvation from beginning to end. Even though we're at some point in the middle, right, God's view sees the whole thing. Right. So when we talk about eschatology, what we're really talking about is that viewpoint of God that sees the whole thing, that sees the end from the beginning. Right? We're talking about the whole picture. So it's not purely things of the future, but it's the whole, the whole picture. And we're going to see that this is going to come up a lot uh, here in a couple of years when we get into St. Paul. Because St. Paul will, will sort of jump back and forth. Like he'll say in Ephesians that we're already seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Well, last I checked, <laughs> my, my recliner at home was not with Christ in the heavenly places. So that's, the, that's the place I'm usually seated. Right? So, but he's talking about from this perspective. So St. Paul can say, from this perspective, our salvation is already accomplished. We're still working it out here on earth. From God's perspective, the whole thing's done. So we have to be aware of sort of that, that shift. So does anybody have any questions about any of that before we... Yeah? I think when you talk about all that you put together, and look at all the various interpretations that go on. And I'm just wondering, uh, when we look at the prophets and how we try to interpret them, the only way we know we're accurate is, is the history itself. Because it seems that the interpretations are incorrect. And I remember listening to one person about Revelation, for example, and saying that it's already been Can do 
is I can take the truth that I've learned that God has taught me and I can remind, I can live my, try to live my life that way and I can try to, to call the people around me to, to live their life that way. Right? And, and hold each other accountable that way. That I can do without any special without any special help. But it's still like you say, if you know your friend is <coughs> doing wrong, you should go tell him, you know what, you, you done went down the wrong road. Right. That, that's what you're talking about. And you know about. what the consequences Basically, of this are going to be. Know. Yeah, you know it's what the consequences of this is going to yeah, be. that's what I'm saying. We all do. <laughs> right. So you, you're, you're just basically taking the knowledge that you've been given and saying, listen, this is not from God, this is you, you're not making, you're right. making a mistake. Right. We're going the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, Zephaniah. We move forward in history a little bit. Uh, there now is no northern kingdom of Israel. All right. This is why, see, we went through all the historical books first, so we sort of have the historical framework. <laughs> Israel is no more. Uh, Judah is left. Judah is being oppressed by the Assyrians at this point. And by oppressed, remember, remember they sort of let the Assyrians in to kind of look around <laughs> at the treasury and everything. So they've sort of, in order to keep the Assyrians from wiping them out, rather than trusting God, Right? They sort of started cutting deals with the Assyrians, started paying them off, started paying them tribute, started, you know, please don't come wipe us out. And so they're on this slippery slope that's ultimately going to lead to Babylon destroying Judah. But while they're on this slope, this is when Zephaniah is sent to come and say, look, we're sliding down the wrong way. We need to stop this. And go back in the other direction. And so, um, Zephaniah uh, would have been during the the reign of Manasseh. Remember we read the short prayer of Manasseh that's not really a book of the Bible, but that's sort of in the Septuagint and that we use liturgically. Uh, Once a year, Manasseh repented is what he's saying, so he's one of the only one of the only kings to actually listen to the prophets sent to him and, and repent although his his uh, descendants didn't keep on that road, they slid back the other way so Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 1 the word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. Let all things be totally consumed from the face of the earth, says the Lord. Let man and cattle cease, let the birds of the air and the fish of the sea be consumed. I shall drive mankind from the face of the land, says the Lord. I shall stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I shall remove the names of Baal from this place and the names of the priests, those who worship the host of heaven on the housetops, and who swear oaths by the Lord and who swear oaths by their king. Those who turn away from the Lord, neither seeking the Lord nor holding steadfastly to Him. So in the doesn't mince words category, <laughs> right? God's going to wipe out. God's, what's the threat? God's going to wipe out humanity and all the animals while He's at it. <laughs> right? Meaning, the idea is we're in a situation like before the flood. Right? This is what they'd be calling back to. Where. God looks at the earth and just says, "I got to start over, <laughs> right? Because this is this is all gone wrong." Right. Verse seven: Fear before the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared His sacrifice; He has sanctified His guests. And it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I shall take vengeance on the princes and on the king's house, and upon all clothed with strange garments. And I will openly take vengeance upon all those in the gates in that day and on those who fill the house of the Lord their God with ungodliness and deceit. This is that idea we've talked about of the day of the Lord. Right? The day of the Lord is coming. He's going to visit. 
not for tea and scones. <laughs> He's going to visit to settle some business. Now this, we're going to see this theme, we're going to see this again in Isaiah, this idea that the Lord has prepared his sacrifice. The way that was typically interpreted, that was typically interpreted by Jewish interpreters leading up to this time. It may still be true today, I'd have to ask one of the rabbis if they still interpret it that way. Was that his sacrifice was going to see it says in verse 8 it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice I shall take revenge on the princes and the king's house right and on the nations right the idea was that the nations were all going to be gathered together and then God was going to smite them all right burn them all up and that that's the sacrifice he's talking about now I would submit that taking evil things and burning them has never been described as a sacrifice anywhere in the Old Testament, right? <laughs> there were things that he put under the ban. Right? We talked about that, the word, the word harem in the Hebrew from back in Joshua, not to be confused with harem, which is the king's wives, or, <laughs> or haram, but, <laughs> but harem, which was where things were to be were unclean and wicked, they were tainted, so they're just to be destroyed utterly. Right? We go into the the pagan temples, right? He said you burn it down and destroy everything. You don't go in there and try and take the gold and the silver and the you just wipe it out. Right? So there was that. But that was not a sacrifice. Right? That was not any of the kind of offerings that God ever asked him for. So, the day of the Lord is here linked with a great sacrifice being made that the Lord himself has prepared. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? This is what, again, the early Christians are going to see when they look at Christ's death. Right? You say, <laughs> when Christ says, you know, have you not read the, <laughs> the scriptures? Right, because they have this idea. What the son of uh, the Messiah is going to die? <laughs> right, there's going to be this sacrifice. Right, so yes, he's going to offer himself as a sacrifice on the day of the Lord. Right. And so, this this gets what they're expecting again gets inverted. They're again expecting God's going to wipe out all these people. Right, what happens is. Christ offers himself as a sacrifice for these people's sins who they wanted wiped out. Shades of Jonah again, right? <laughs> Jonah getting mad because God shows mercy on the, on the Ninevites. Verse 10. In that day, says the Lord, there will be from the gate the sound of shouting from men killing and a wailing from the second gate along with a great destruction from the hills. Mourn those of you dwelling there being cut down in pieces, for all the people are like Canaan. All those exalting in silver are utterly destroyed. And it shall come to pass in that day that I shall search Jerusalem with a lamp, and shall take vengeance on the men, having scorned their charge, the ones saying in their hearts, The Lord shall not do any good, nor shall he do any harm. And their power will be for plundering, and their houses for complete destruction. They will build houses, but will not live in them, and they will plant vineyards, but will not drink of their wine. So the idea is Judah has essentially become like the Canaanites who God had to drive out in the first place. And so they're going to suffer the same consequence the Canaanites did. Right? we got to remember, we, we saw the flip side of this when we were talking about Edom, right? They're not the chosen people. God still loves them. God still cares about them. God still wants them to repent. Well, this is the flip side. The Jews, they're the chosen people. But if they do the same things the Canaanites do, they're going to face the same judgment the Canaanites face. Right. Verse 14, For the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and quick. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter and harsh. A mighty day of wrath has been appointed, a day of affliction and distress, a day of unseasonable happenings and destruction. A day of gloom and darkness, a day of cloud and vapor, a day of the trumpet and shouting against the fortified cities and the high towers. 
I will greatly afflict the men, and they will walk as blind men, for they sinned against the Lord, and he shall pour out their blood as dust, and their flesh as dung. Their silver and gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord, but the whole land shall be consumed by the fire of his zeal, for he will bring about a speedy end to all those who dwell in the land. So, again, no mincing words, right? That's it for Jerusalem and Judah. Right? The point's coming when it's going to be at an end. Chapter 2. O untaught nation, be gathered together and united to one another. Before you become like a flower that passes away, before the anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day of the wrath of the Lord comes upon you, seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth. Bring about justice, seek righteousness, and give answer to these things, so you may be sheltered in the day of the Lord's wrath. For Gaza shall be for pillaging, and Ashkelon shall be for extermination. Ashdod shall be driven out at midday, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to those dwelling on the seacoast, neighbors of the Cretans. O Canaan, land of the Philistines, the word of the Lord is against you, and I shall destroy you out of your dwelling place. Crete shall be a pasture for flocks and folds for sheep. The seacoast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. Upon them they shall pasture their flocks in the houses of Ashkelon. In the evening they will rest because of the presence of the children of Judah. For the Lord their God has cared for them and has removed their captivity. I have heard the insults of Moab and the cruel acts of the people of Ammon, by which they have paraded my people and exalted themselves against my borders. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Moab shall be like Sodom and the sons of Ammon like Gomorrah, and Damascus is like a heap left on the threshing floor and ruined forever. And the remnant of my people will plunder them, and the remnant of my nation will inherit them. This is their punishment because they have reproached and exalted themselves against the Lord Almighty. The Lord shall show himself to be against them and shall utterly destroy all the gods of the earth. And they will worship him, each one from his place, even all the islands of the nations. Now notice there that turn at the end. But so, God first says, he's, out, he's going to punish his people. If they don't repent, judgment and punishment is coming. And then he warns their neighbors. Right? Because he knows what's happening. He knows that the Philistines who are left, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Arameans up in Damascus, right, the Syrians, they're all using what's happened to Israel and what's going to happen to Judah. They're coming in and invading. They're pillaging. Right? They're looting. They're all happy <laughs> about what's happening to Judah and Israel. Right? And the way they would typically interpret this right? The fact that Israel is waning is that, well, Israel's God and Judah's God must not be that powerful. Right? Because he's not protecting them. So the gods of the Assyrians who are taking everybody over, right? The gods of the Babylonians, our God must be better. So God pauses for a second from talking to Jerusalem and talks to them and says, Now don't start thinking what I know you're thinking because of what's happening to Judah because this judge, same judgment is coming for all of you coming for all of you and it's time but what's the ultimate result of that judgment upon them is that once the Lord has judged them right once he's brought back his people from captivity and they've seen how great he is they're all going to end up worshipping the Lord Now once again, we've talked several times before about this with the Gentiles. Here in the Old Testament, this is a fundamental piece right, of the eschatology of the Old Testament. Right, is that after the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord is going to come, and then after the day of the Lord, the Gentiles are going to come and worship Yahweh, the God of Israel. Right? We've seen it over and over and over again in these prophetic books. It is just dropped out in modern Judaism. Right. They've gone right back to all the other nations are going to be destroyed or enslaved or something. Right. But not to, they're all going to come and once they've witnessed this display, they're going to come in and worship the Lord. Right. They're going to join with... And this is 
you know, even to the, the islands of the nations. I don't know if we've mentioned this before. We're going to hear about the islands a lot in Isaiah and Ezekiel. The islands of the nations, you have to remember the, the world as they saw it on the east end of the Mediterranean. The islands are the islands sort of like Gibraltar off on the far end of the Mediterranean. That's as far out as they could. Right? That's sort of like us saying Timbuktu. Right? <laughs> you know? All the way off in, you know. That's, so this is even the islands, right? Even in the islands of the nations, even out there, <laughs> out there in Timbuktu, out there in the middle of nowhere, even there they're going to worship the Lord. Once they've seen this happen. Verse 12, O Ethiopians, you are the slain of my sword, and he shall stretch out his hand to the north and destroy the Assyrian and make Nineveh a waterless desolation, desolation as a desert. And flocks will graze in the midst of her, even all the wild animals of the land. And the chameleons and hedgehogs will sleep in her coffered ceilings. And wild animals will cry out between her breaches and ravens in her gates, for her loftiness was as a cedar. This is the contemptuous city who dwells in hope, who says in her heart, I am and there is none beside me. What is that, by the way? <laughs> I am, right, is the name of God. Right? You have no other gods before you. So he's talking about the Ninevites, you know, say that they're the great city. There is none, you know, they've turned themselves into a god. And they're going to be <coughs> brought down a peg. <laughs> well, that's that's a translation. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a it's an English translation of a Greek translation. It's more. I mean, the, the original, like the chameleons, is actually the original sort of like creeping things. It's kind of vague. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so creeping things you just mean it's actually the Greek word is herpetone, which we where we get herpetology, which we study uh, reptiles. So, they were more specific in this translation than, than the original is. <laughs> so, but the idea is that these, these sort of just odd wild animals that creep will be, you know, running around there because there's no people there. You know, you have all these beautiful, majestic buildings, you know, and there's going to be wild dogs, you know, running around in them because... The people are all gone. It's been wiped out. That's why they'll be there, hunting hedgehogs. Showing that it's in the Yeah. Yeah, that's just going to be a desolate wilderness. Uh, so back to verse This is the contemptuous city who dwells in hope, who says in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. How she has even become a desolation, a pasture for wild beasts. Everyone passing through her will hiss and shake his fists. Chapter 3, Alas, the glorious and ransomed city, the dove did not listen to the voice, nor did she accept correction, nor did she trust in the Lord, and she did not draw near to her God. Remember we talked about last time, doves, not a symbol of peace in the Old Testament, a symbol of dumb. <laughs> a symbol of, of lack of intelligence. Did, did not listen to the Lord, did not accept correction, did not trust in the Lord, did not draw near to her God. Her rulers are in her as roaring lions, and her judges are as wolves of Arabia that remain until morning. Her prophets born by the wind, men who are scoffers. The bearers of the Spirit are men who are scoffers. Her priests profane the holy things and live contrary to the law. But the Lord in her midst is just and will never act unjustly. Morning by morning he will give his judgment in the light and it is not concealed. He does not grant injustice by extortion nor injustice by strife. All right, so God's contrasting himself with the people who he put in charge. And this is going to be, we've already heard it a little bit, but you know, he put these people in charge, whether they be priests, the prophet, the king, to be shepherds. Right? And they become like wolves. Right? They're preying on God's people instead of, instead of caring for them. Uh, contrasting with, but the Lord, <laughs> unlike them, is going to always be just. Right? Which is a promise to those people who are being oppressed, but is a threat to those people who are doing the oppressing. Right? They're not going to be, they may take bribes, but they're not going to be able to bribe him. 
Verse 6, I have brought down the arrogant with destruction and their cornerstones are destroyed. I will make their streets totally desolate so that none can pass through. Their cities are destroyed because there is no one to live or dwell in them. I said, but fear me and receive instruction and you will not be completely uprooted from the face of it. For much vengeance I have taken against her. Prepare yourself, rise early in the morning, for every last small grape left for the gleaners has been spoiled. So, so the gleaners are going to be coming in the morning, but because I know this prophecy, if I get up at 3 in the morning, I'll have some grapes left. No, he's saying, he's saying it's too late. The grapes are all spoiled. <laughs> the grapes are all rotten. He said, but notice again in verse 7, but fear me and receive instruction and you will not be completely uprooted from the face of it. This is all you really need to do. <laughs> Stop what you're doing and listen. Listen to what I have to tell you. If you would just listen, none of this would, ha- none of this would have to happen. Verse 8, on account of this, wait for me, says the Lord, until the day of my rising up as a testimony. For my judgment shall be for the gathering of the nations, to receive kings, to pour out upon them all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be consumed with the fire of my jealousy. For then I shall transform for the people a language for her generation, for all to call upon the name of the Lord, to serve him under one yoke. From the boundaries of the rivers of Ethiopia they will bring offerings to me. And that day you will not be ashamed of all your practices in which you acted profanely against me. For at that time I will take away from you the contempt of your arrogance, and you shall no longer be haughty upon my holy mountain. And I will leave among you a gentle and humble people who will show reverence to the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will not commit unrighteousness nor speak vanities. Neither will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they will feed and lie down, and there will be no one terrifying them. So again we see what? After the day of the Lord... There's a remnant of Israel and people from all the nations. That's what the people of God looks like after, after the day of the Lord, according to Zephaniah. And again, we have that image of, of the people being sheep who are shepherded, that, that they could feed and lie down. There's no one terrifying them. Right? All those wolves are gone. so the people can be at peace. Verse 14, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Cry aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Be glad and rejoice with your whole heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your iniquities and ransomed you from your enemies. The Lord, the King of Israel, is in your midst. You will no longer see any evil. At that time the Lord shall say to Jerusalem, O Zion, be of good courage. Do not let your hands grow slack. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty one shall save you. He shall bring gladness upon you and will renew you with his love. He will delight over you with joys in a day of feasting. I shall gather together your broken ones. Alas, who has taken up a reproach against her? Behold, at that time I will act among you for your sake, says the Lord. I will save the oppressed and welcome those being rejected. I will make them a praise and renown throughout the whole earth. And they shall be put to shame in that day when I do well with you. At the time when I shall receive you. For I will make you praised and renowned among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captivity, says the Lord. So, again, just to summarize, as we've seen in other books, the picture here is the day the Lord comes, right, with its, with its judgment, right? Well, actually, first the people, the people go into captivity, the people face judgment, people return from their captivity, there's the day of the Lord, for which the Lord has prepared his sacrifice. And after this, what is left is a remnant of Israel joined by people from all the nations and worshiping the Lord. Right? That's the picture that Zephaniah gives us. And this is the picture that St. Paul is going to pick up on and say, this is happening right now. Right? Israel has been brought back out of captivity. The day of the Lord has come. The death and resurrection of Christ. Now, there's a remnant of Israel who believes in Christ and is being joined by people from every country in the world, right? every nation in the world. So things, from St. Paul's perspective, play out exactly, exactly as the scriptures 
said they were. Going back just a, a little bit, it says, uh, I'm trying to verse, verse 11, uh, in chapter 3, today you will not be ashamed. And he talks about the haughtiness of the people on the open mountain. Right. Is he, is the Lord directing this toward the arrogance of the priesthood? Mm -hmm. And we are Jews and you are not, and we are chosen and you are not. Well, more it's what he's talking about. Um, in verse 4, let's look at half of verse 4. Her priests profane the holy things and live contrary to the law. Okay. Right? And the prophets who are scoffers. <laughs> you know, this is that. They're, they're the people entrusted to take care of the sheep. They become wolves. So they're going to be. All right. And they're going to be removed <laughs> from that mount. Yeah. But, uh, and just to add, just to add, in addition to to our Jewish brothers and sisters who have sort of lost track of this whole idea of the Gentiles coming in. So of our Christian brothers and sisters and their eschatological schemes <laughs> about the end times will come to you and say, well, there are promises in the prophets, the very books we're reading, directed toward Israel that God is going to restore them. I agree. <laughs> but they're going to say that God is going to restore them and these promises are given to Israel separately. Right? So there's Israel and there's the church. There's Christianity, the Christian church. And those are two different things. Okay? That view is broadly called dispensationalism. It started in the middle of the 19th century. A guy named Thomas Darby who was a Presbyterian of all things. But <laughs> uh, they're two separate groups. Now, all I'm going to say about that right now, because we're going to have more to say about that as we get into some of these other books. All I'm going to say about that now is I would point out that in all these books we've seen, when it describes the people of God, right, when it describes the people of God in the latter days, I never see any place where it describes a remnant of Israel over here as one thing, and then some Gentiles who have come to believe in Jesus over here as another thing. Every place we've seen so far, when it describes the people of God, there's a remnant of Israel and people, all together. Right? All together. One people of one people of God made up of Jews and Greeks and Ethiopians and everyone else. Did not Jesus quote who says, uh, many shall come from the east and west will sit down with Abraham yep. and was talking about Gentiles? Right, so now with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Yeah. He's talking about the Gentile people. Yeah. Now, how exactly. did you have the Gentile over here and the Jews over here? Right. Because yeah. <laughs> it's like they say here, pure language. We know at the Tower of Babylon, the language was changed, and everybody's got different tongues. Right. Like you got the Chinese, you got the Ethiopia. That means that everybody will all speak the same language one of these days. Like well, that's right. And that's the, that's the thanks for bring that up actually, we see he talks about that you'll have a new language right? remember the Tower of Babel happened right after right after the flood so right after the flood right, people start becoming numerous again and what do they do, they all get together to try to build to build an artificial mouth of God so they can reach up to heaven under their own power right, so as soon as they start to get numerous again, they start going right down the same road as before the flood. Right? So God, in order to stop them, right, in order to sort of reign in human evil, right, he confuses their languages so they can't all work together. Right? The Tower of Babylon. And it scatters them all. Right? So now they can't speak, they can't speak the same language. Well now. Because the issue of human sin and wickedness has been taken care of, right? Now all people from all nations can gather on God's holy mountain and all worship him with one language and one voice. Right? There's no need for those distinctions and separations anymore. Right? Because now everyone's joined in one cause and that's worshiping that's worshiping God. So we saw that in, in Genesis. A lot of what's going on in Genesis is time and time again, God trying to rein in human evil. 
Right, starting with right after they sin, he says, well, I can't let them eat of the tree of life because if they eat of the tree of life, they'll live forever in this sinful, wicked state. That'd be hell on earth, right? So he blocks them off from paradise. Death comes into the world as a way of keeping a lid on human evil. After the flood, he says, they're living too long. <laughs> he says, I'm going to cap it in 120 years. So you can only do so much wickedness. Right? And then the Tower of Babel, they're starting to, okay, well, we'll confuse the light, we'll split them up. Right? So they won't be able to do the kind of great evils they'll do when they all get together. Right? It's God, we're trying to rein that in. Right? Rein that in. Okay. Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> the question was whether the, the church sees any, I'm assuming spiritual significance, yes. right, to the creation of the modern country of Israel. And the answer, I mean, the short answer is no. Short answer is no. Um, <laughs> it's, a political, it's, a political it's, a, it's a political entity. Right, Zionism. but it's but it's not it's not the spiritual Israel because they are following Christ. And they're not really spiritual, right? So, and we're going to get into this a lot when we get into Romans and Galatians, because a lot of what St. Paul's talking about there is who's really a Jew, who's really from the seed of Abraham. Is it someone who just happens to have been born? from a descendant of Abraham, or is it someone who has the faith that Abraham had? Right. And he's going to argue it's the person who has the faith that Abraham had, who is the descendant of Abraham. And if you're, you're you know, genealogically descended from Abraham, but you don't have faith, then that's not, that's not going to do anything for you. Right. Whereas if you're not genealogically descended, but you share his faith, then you've been grafted in right, to that tree. I mean, well, and that's, the church is reading right now is Galatians. Right. And that's and daily readings. not just a New Testament thing. We already saw that in the Old Testament. We saw that with Caleb, who was a Canaanite, who became a member of the tribe of Judah. Uh, we saw that with Ruth, who was a Moabite. It's just like people that think you have to be Who became a Jew. Right. <laughs> yeah. Laharim, Jericho, Rahab. I'm sorry. Rahab came and found Rahab. Right? When they come to share faith in the God of Israel, they become Israelites. They're, they're Jews, just like anyone else. It doesn't matter that they're not genealogically descended from Abraham. Right? I mean, that's, and if that's true in the Old Testament, how much more true is that now, <laughs> you know, when all the nations are coming to One thing know Christ? One thing that's come up in the last few weeks more than once. During the service, we were talking about saved by people <laughs> that's people who don't speak Greek. That's right. Some people Technically speaking, a, a barbarian is someone who doesn't speak Greek. So. <laughs> that's where the, that's where the word comes from. The word the word. Uh, Bar bar. Barbari, which is the plural. It, it, other languages sounded to the Greeks like they were going bar 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 bar. Oh. So <laughs> they called them. They called them barbary <laughs> if, they, if they could speak Greek. Was this written the barbarian invasion? It was, yeah, it was written during the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire. Yeah. So I'm talking, talking about the, mainly the Persians and the Arabs. If it had been written today, it would say, save us from the terrorists. It were written today. Yeah, well, yeah. That's why usually we get enemies or adversaries right. in a lot of translations. But, yeah, the original. And so it goes from that, not speaking Greek, to just in general meaning someone who's uneducated or uncivilized. <laughs> right? Was the was the later meaning of it. But, yeah, that's where it comes from, was 
Everybody sounded like bar, 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 bar. Okay, so next book up is Haggai. And I know that's not what it looks like, but that is actually the correct pronunciation. <laughs> Um, H-A-G-G-A-I is how it's transliterated. It's actually... It's actually... <laughs> well, it has to do with the way vowels are written and not written in Hebrew and Aramaic. It's the same, uh, the same way we end up with Jehovah instead of Yahweh. If you don't write vowels, then when people transliterate, they kind of guess. But, <laughs> so... Uh, so... Haggai, we're moving a little bit forward in time again. Haggai is, is writing around uh, 520 BC. So around the time when uh, the Jews are just starting to return. The, Jews, the first groups of, of Jews are going back to Jerusalem. So he's not really what we call post-exilic, but he's not really during the exile either, he's sort of right on the cusp, right? As the exile is starting to end, and they're starting, they're starting to return uh, to Jerusalem. So he's writing under the Persian emperor Darius, who's the successor of Cyrus, who was one of his generals. Uh, we talked a little about the Persians before. We'll talk about the Persians a lot more when we get to Daniel, uh, because a lot of Daniel taking is going to take place in, in the Persian Empire proper. Uh, and so, as I said, this is going to be the uh, situation. They've just started heading back, and things are already starting to go in the wrong direction. So this is this is going to be Haggai the prophet speaking speaking to them. So Haggai one in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet saying, speak to Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel from the tribe of Judah and Joshua son of Jehozadak the high priest this message remember Zerubbabel was the descendant of the king All right, so these are, the, these are the current right now quote unquote leaders <laughs> right, in the Persian Empire but about to become the, the leaders of this new new establishment of Judah Thus says the Lord Almighty, This people says the time has not come to build the Lord's house. Okay. So, when they first got back there, remember there's a lot of waffling back and forth on rebuilding the temple, and rebuilding the walls and what they should do, and people being kind of scared too, because they're scared of their neighbors surrounding them, coming and attacking them. And so, that's what this is introducing. The people are waffling. <laughs> God's now trying to restore them, bring them back and restore them, but the people are, are having a uh, crisis, crisis of courage in terms of doing what they need to do. Verse 3, Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses while this house stands in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord Almighty, Consider your ways. You have sown much and brought in little. You have eaten, but you are not satisfied. But you have drunk, but not to get drunk. You have clothed yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord Almighty, carefully consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and cut wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord Almighty, you looked for much, but little came. And when it was brought into the house, I blew it away, because my house is desolate. While each one of you hurries to his own house. Because of this, the heavens above you will withhold the dew, and the earth withhold its fruit. And I shall bring a sword upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the grain, and upon the wine, and upon the oil, and upon whatever the ground brings forth, and on men and livestock, and on all the labor of their hands. Okay, so he says, <laughs> you may have noticed, <laughs> right? You've gone back there and you've planted crops, and they're not growing so well. <laughs> Right, and you know you've 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 had things, but it's not working out the way you want. Right? In fact, you're probably saying that I promised you that when I brought you back to the land, I would bless you. 
And you're going, wondering where the blessings are. He says, well, <laughs> I sent you back. I sent you back there. You started planting your own vineyards and building your own houses and you got kind of comfortable there, but you're too scared to go and rebuild the temple, right? My house, right? You're too scared to go and, and rebuild the city. And so until you follow through on what I've commanded you to do, don't expect these blessings you're wanting <laughs> right, to be forthcoming. So at that point, he's telling them, don't worry about your house, build the temple, build the walls, and I will take care of it. Right. And, and I'll take care of the rest. And I'll take care of the rest. Instead, you all go up on the hill and build your own house and forget about it. Right. So that's why he's back there now telling them, well, we're back in the mess. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Remember, they went into exile because they all got rich and well fed and <laughs> they forgot about God. Right. Well, God put them into exile, and now he's brought them back, and already they're forgetting about him again. Right. Same cycle starting all over again. Verse 12, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, from the tribe of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, heeded the word of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him to them. And the people feared in the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai the Lord's messenger said these words to the people, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, from the tribe of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month, in the second year of King Darius. Okay, so this, this, they're doing better, right? <laughs> this is the prophet comes and says, hey, you're starting this all over again, and they turn, they turn back, right? And notice what he says to them that gets them stirred up, right? Because again, it was this courage issue, right? <laughs> the Lord says, I am with you, right? And you don't, don't worry. Don't worry about it. Don't be afraid. And so the leadership <laughs> gets their courage up and says, okay, let's do this. Chapter 2, in the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the Lord spoke by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, from the tribe of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, saying, Who among you saw this house in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Is this not in your eyes as being nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. And work, for I am with you, says the Lord Almighty. And my spirit remains among you. Take courage. For thus says the Lord Almighty, Once more I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the choice things of all the nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord Almighty. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord Almighty. And peace of soul for a possession to everyone who builds and raises this temple. So again, you notice he was referring to the Lord Almighty. Right? We talked about it before. The idea that all the power on earth is his, right? All the silver and the gold on earth is his. <laughs> he can put it where he wants it. He can bring it where he wants it. So they have nothing to be afraid of from anybody else because the God they worship is all powerful and he's with them. Right? So no matter how small they are, no matter how weak they are, he is with them. Verse 10, On the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord Almighty, Now ask the priests concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and the edge touches bread or stew, wine or oil, or any food, will it become holy? Then the priests answered and said, No. Hey, I said, if one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it be unclean? So the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is this people, so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so are all the works of their hands. Whoever comes near them shall be unclean because of their early burdens. They shall be distressed because of their toils, and you have hated him who rebukes in the gates. And now consider from this day forward, from before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord, what manner of people you were. 
When you put 20 ephahs of barley into the bin, and there were but 10. When you came to the wine vat to draw out 50 measures from the press, but only 20 were there. I struck you with bareness and blight and hail in all the labors of your hands. Yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. Establish your hearts from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought to this. Is the seed still on the threshing floor? And as yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. For from this day I shall bless you. So he's reiterating. <laughs> right? He's, say, he's saying, remember, when I brought you back here to rebuild this temple, it wasn't because you guys were all of a sudden a shining example of, <laughs> of, <laughs> you know, of virtuous living. Right. All of a sudden, you guys got your act together. He's like, you were a bunch of unclean people just like when I exiled you. Right? He says, but I brought you back here. Right? And he says, and remember how when I brought you back here and you weren't thankful to me, I didn't bless you. Right? Remember that. Don't forget. Now that the temple's going to get rebuilt. Now that the city's going to get rebuilt. Now that things are going to start going better and I'm going to start blessing you again. Don't forget that like you forgot it before. Right? Because that's what happened, remember? They forgot all that stuff about being slaves in Egypt. They forgot all that stuff about being taken care of in the wilderness. They forgot all about it because they got rich and prosperous. And they ended up in wickedness and destruction. So he's saying, this time, don't forget. Remember. Verse 20, and again the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet a second time on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel from the tribe of Judah, saying, I shall shake heaven and earth and the sea and the dry land. I shall overthrow the thrones of kings, and I will destroy the power of the kings of the nations. And I shall overthrow both chariots and riders. The horses and their riders will come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says Lord Almighty, I shall take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord. And shall make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you. So again, that last promise, remember they're afraid of their neighbors. He says, you don't have to worry about the armies and the, these other nations. I will take care of them. Right? The day is coming when, when I will take care of them. There's nothing to be afraid of. Okay, okay so that's Haggai. Another short... <laughs> short but sweet book. But we can see I mean, the, the, the key to what's going on in Haggai there is again, this new start is happening. Right? And God through Haggai telling them this needs to be a new start and you need to not make the same mistakes <laughs> this time that you made last time. And so this is, this is teaching us something about repentance. <laughs> right? That repentance doesn't just isn't just being sorry for what we've done, but it's now setting forth on another foot, right? To go in a different direction and not repeat the same things over and over again. So now Zechariah. Zechariah is roughly contemporary with Haggai. He's a little later. He's a little later. So a little more settling and building has gone on. <laughs> but he's also here during this Persian period. Sort of, he's now, really, he should be considered the first post exilic prophet as the people are returning. Okay. And so, as we're going to see here, as we get into it, there are going to be some things that are probably going to, if you've ever read the book of Revelation, there are going to be some things in here that are going to be immediately familiar to you. Um, <laughs> So this is, this is also the book where we first meet some, some apocalyptic literature. Okay, and Ze Zechariah means, uh, by the way, his name means Yahweh, the Lord remembers. So Zechariah chapter 1, verse 1, In the eighth month of the second year of the reign of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Addo the prophet, saying, The Lord has been very angry with your fathers, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord Almighty, Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord. And do not become like your fathers, whom the former prophets accused, saying, Thus says the Lord Almighty, Turn from your evil ways and your evil practices. 
But they did not pay attention or heed me, says the Lord. Now you have to remember, exile was about 70 years. So, when he's talking to these people who have now come back from the exile about their fathers, he means, literally, their parents' generation and their grandparents' generation, right? The generation that went into the exile in the first place. And so he's saying, don't be like them. <laughs> Who I had to send the prophets to them and denounce them. What was Darius? It was actually Cyrus. Cyrus, okay. Cyrus his friends <laughs> who let them go back. Um, there were a couple of pieces. First, uh, Cyrus... Cyrus and, and was the first empire. He really created the Persian Empire. Uh, had a very different philosophy of rule from the Babylonians and the Assyrians. The Babylonians and the Assyrians tried to destroy other uh, ethnic identities so that they wouldn't be able to rise up against them. Whereas Cyrus uh, coined the, the title for himself, King of Kings. He preferred to let nations stay quote unquote intact just under him. Right? So the Persian Empire was actually made up of little sort of kingdoms that had pledged their fealty to him. He only went to war with you if you refused to pay him tribute. Uh, if you were willing to pay him tribute to become part of his empire, great. Uh, then you'd be one of his vassals right? instead of an independent king. And so he had less of a problem with the idea of the Jewish people sort of having their own city and having their own king. The other piece was, as we're going to see in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah predicts the coming of someone named Cyrus about, about 200 years before Cyrus came about. <laughs> and so uh, we're, we're actually told in the scriptures at one point that the the uh, the priests, some of the priests who were in uh, Babylon after Cyrus conquered it, brought him the scrolls of Isaiah and showed him that his name was in there <laughs> as, as this king who was going to help their people. And he was sort of flattered by it, right, that he appeared in the holy writings of <laughs> these people. And so that sort of helped uh, cajole him as well. So it's the two pieces. He was less threatened by that idea and that fit with his scheme of governing and the fact that they came and told him, well, you're, you're, you were prophesying right, to be someone who would help us. Question. Is it possible for some kid to ask the Jewish woman that became Esther is a little, little later. Uh, yeah, Esther is, uh, uh, is with uh, Xerxes, who was Darius's successor. So she's a little bit late. Okay. So verse 5, your fathers, where are they? <laughs> Remember he's saying, don't be like that. So your father, what, what happened to them? You know, rhetorical question, obviously. And the prophets, will they live forever? Right? So we say, the, the prophets, right, your fathers who persecuted and didn't believe the prophets, where are they now and where are the prophets now? Right? So you follow the prophets, not the way your fathers live. If I receive my words and my ordinances as I commanded by my spirit to my servants, the prophets who overtook your fathers... And they answered and said, As the Lord Almighty determined to deal with us according to our ways and according to our practices, thus he dealt with us. So what do they say in response is, God told us he was going to judge us according to what we did, and he did. <laughs> Meaning they're accepting that what happened to their fathers and to them was just. But yeah, we, we chose the wrong thing. We suffered the consequences for it. Verse 7, the second year of the reign of Darius, on the 24th day of the 11th month, this is the month Sabbat, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Addo, the prophet, saying, I saw a vision in the night. Okay, now we're in vision territory. <laughs> okay. 
I saw a vision in the night, and behold, a man was mounted on a red horse. And he stood in the midst of the two shaded mountains, and behind him were red, dapple gray, piebald, and white horses. And I said, My Lord, what are these? And the angel talking to me said, I will show you what these are. And the man who stood in the midst of the mountains replied and said to me, These are those whom the Lord sent forth to go out into all the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord who stood in the midst of the mountains and said, We have gone out into all the earth, and behold, all the earth is inhabited and is at peace. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord Almighty, how long will you show no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, which you disregarded these seventy years? And the Lord Almighty replied to the angel who was speaking to me with kind and comforting words. And the angel speaking to me said to me, Cry out, saying, Thus says the Lord Almighty, I have been jealous for both Jerusalem and Zion with great jealousy. I am exceedingly angry with the nations joining together against her, with whom I was only a little angry, but then they joined together with evil intent. Therefore thus says the Lord, I shall return to Jerusalem with compassion, and in her my house shall be rebuilt, says the Lord Almighty. The measuring line shall indeed be stretched out over Jerusalem. And the angel talking to me said to me, Cry out again, saying, Thus says the Lord Almighty, Cities shall yet overflow with prosperity, and hereafter the Lord will have mercy on Zion, and will choose Jerusalem. This isn't the end of the vision, but <laughs> as a point to pause. So what does he see? He sees four horsemen. <laughs> yeah. Does that sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> these, these four are going to show up again in the book of Revelation. <laughs> This is, this is one of the reasons why, even though the New Testament is more popular, why I started with the Old Testament for Bible study. Because if you haven't read and understood the Old Testament, then you're not going to know what to do with the, the, New, Testament. <laughs> the New Testament. Right? Because you're not going to know what they're referring It's not tanks. I can guarantee you. <laughs> so there's these four horsemen. Right? And who are they? The Lord sent them forth to go out into all the earth. And at this point, right, they've gone out to all the earth, right, gone to the four corners, and they report back, the earth is at peace, right? The earth is at peace. But there's still a problem, right? What's that problem? Well, Israel's been in exile for years. So the angel of the Lord cries out and says, how long are you going to ignore them? Now we're going to see this, this is not quite as famous as the four horsemen, but when we get to the book of Revelation, one of the first things we're going to hear is the souls of the martyrs who are underneath the altar in heaven are going to cry out, how long, O Lord, <laughs> until you take vengeance for what's happened to them, right, for their martyrdom. Right? So this is a continuing motif. <laughs> this is that St. John's going to pick up on in his vision. So everything seems to be at peace and everything seems to be prosperous, but there's this problem in that God's people and Judah are still suffering in exile. So the angel of the Lord says to the Lord, how long are you going to allow this to go on? And he says, I'm not. <laughs> right? I'm returning them. I'm returning them to their place and I'm going to bless them. Okay. So chapter 2, and I looked up and behold four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, my Lord, what are these? And he said to me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah and Israel. And the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said, what are they coming to do? And he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah and broke Israel in pieces. And not one of them looked up. And they came forth to sharpen these with their hands, the four horns. The nations that lifted, up, lifted their horn up against the land of the Lord to scatter it. Okay. So horns, right? Horns are a symbol of power or authority. So these four horns, we're told, represent the nations, right? Assyria, Babylon, Persia, who came and destroyed Israel and sent Jerusalem into exile. Right? Now, what's the point of these craftsmen sharpening the horns? Where did they get, where did those nations who attacked Israel, because remember part of the problem again is that now that the people of Judah are returning, the other nations are... They ready to attack them. 
These nations that destroyed Israel and Judah in the first place, where did they get their power and authority? God. From God. Right? God's the one who sharpened them. Right? Meaning, meaning, they're not outside of God's control. Right? It's not like God's not in control of this situation and oh no, there's just a few there's just a few of them now in Judah. These other nations are going to steamroll them. It's like, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> right? God's saying, I'm the one who judged Israel and Judah. Right? Not those nations. I'm the one who judged them. So verse 5, And I looked up and behold, a man, and in his hand was a measuring line. And I said to him, Where are you going? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem, to see its width and its length. And behold, the angel who was speaking to me stood up, and another angel went to meet him. And he spoke to him, saying, Run and speak to that young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be fruitfully inhabited by reason of the multitude of men and livestock in the midst of her. And I will be for her a wall of fire all around, says the Lord. And I will be in glory in the midst of her, says the Lord. O, oh, O, oh, flee from the land of the north, says the Lord, because I will gather you together from the four winds of heaven, says the Lord. What's the land of the north? Babylon. Right. Escape to Zion, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says the Lord Almighty, He has sent me out after glory to the nations that plundered you. For the one who assails you is as one who assails the apple of his eye. For behold, I bring my hand against them, and they shall be plundered to those serving them. And you will know the Lord Almighty sent me. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I am coming to you. And I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. And in that day many nations shall flee to the Lord for refuge, and they will be his people. And they will dwell in your midst, and you shall know the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. And the Lord will inherit Judah, his portion in the Holy Land, and he will still choose Jerusalem. Let all flesh fear before the presence of the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy clouds. Okay, so what's being described here is the new Jerusalem. And it's populated again. We should expect by now, by who? The remnant of Judah and people from all the nations. Right? And people from all the nations who all come together to dwell in the, new, in the new Jerusalem. So is the new Jerusalem the one they were building on earth at that time? Right. Right. Because again, we're seeing things from this other perspective. Right? We're seeing the real Jerusalem. Right? The Jerusalem that God sees. Right? The capital of his kingdom. Right? Not not the physical one at earth on earth at some point in history. Right? And remember, just as a detail, and again we'll get to this at the end of the book of Revelation, but I will be for her a wall of fire all around, and I will be in glory in the midst of her. Remember, there's no night. <laughs> In the New Jerusalem, when St. John talks about it. So he's picking up this same, the same image. But again, it's the remnant of Judah and people from all the nations who make up the people of the Lord who live, live here in this new city. Chapter 3, And the Lord showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the presence of the angel of the Lord. And the devil stood at his right hand to oppose him. Yeah. So again, we're seeing now from God's perspective, <laughs> right? When God looks at John, the same Joshua the high priest we read about Haggai, right? He's the high priest right now, Joshua the high priest. He's standing there where? In the presence of the Lord. What does that mean he's doing? He's serving as a priest, right? But notice who else is there? The devil at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to the devil, the Lord rebukes you, O devil, even the Lord choosing for himself Jerusalem rebukes you. Behold, is this one not like a brand plucked from the fire? And Joshua was clothed in filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And he said to him, Behold, I have taken your iniquities away from you. Now clothe him with a long robe, and place upon his head a clean mitre. So they clothed him and put a clean mitre on his head, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. Then the angel of the Lord testified to Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord Almighty, If you walk in my paths and if you keep my commands, you shall judge my house, and if you will diligently guard my courtyard, I will give you those to walk in the midst of these who stand here. 
Hear then, O Joshua the high priest, you and your neighbors sitting before you. For these men are prophets. For behold, I bring forth my servant the day spring. For the stone which I place before the face of Joshua, upon one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I am digging a pit, says the Lord Almighty, and I will search out every wrongdoing of that land in one day. On that day, says the Lord Almighty, each of you will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. So that gets kind of confusing there. <laughs> it starts out pretty clear, right? Joshua is standing there, and he's standing there in dirty vestments, right? Because remember in Haggai, he said, remember you were an unclean people when I brought you back. That included the priests and the king. Right? But God takes away those dirty robes, gives him clean new ones to serve before him. It says, if you follow my commandments, right, it's that you and the priests with you will here walk in my presence, meaning their worship here on earth will be real worship. Right? Real worship in the heavenly places. And then the rest of this is he's giving sort of a warning. Right? That his his servant is coming. Right? Who he calls here the day spring. Right? The beginning of the dawn. Right? His servant is coming. And when his servant is coming, the idea of the one stone with seven eyes, remember we said seven is the number that represents completeness, all of it. So he's saying, My servant, the day spring, who will see everything. Right? Who will see everything. This pit he's digging is a symbol of judgment. Right? Symbol of judgment. So he's saying to him, you need to walk before me and be righteous because my servant is coming. There's going to be a day. He says everything's going to be reckoned in one day. Right? This is the day of the Lord again. Day of the Lord is coming and my servant is coming who will see everything. Right? And there's a pit prepared for the, the bodies. <laughs> Right, of those who are of those who are wicked. That's judgment. So that's what he's alluding to. Right? He's saying this day of the Lord, the day of judgment is coming, and so you need to live the right way now, so that when that day comes you'll be prepared. So there he's predicting that Jesus is coming. Right. And that's, that's what we would say. That that his servant the day spring, the dawn from a high is Christ. Yeah. And that Christ who sees everything going to judge on that day. Question. Yeah. I read in another Bible that Joshua stands for, in Greek it stands for Jesus. It is, the, it is the same name. Jesus? Yeah. Yeshua. Okay. Yeah. And so this high priest has the same name. Right? It means uh, uh, Yahweh saves. Yeah. Yeah. And so so this is this is the picture <laughs> Not just the high priest, but this is a picture of how God views us, right? We stand before God. We've got the devil there accusing us, right? We stand before the angel of the Lord. We pick up on this imagery of the vestments all through our uh, baptismal service, right? That they're clothed with a new garment, right? And that their goal is to keep that garment as clean for the rest of their lives as it is at the time of of their baptism. Right? So that when that day comes, the day of judgment, the day of the Lord comes, we're prepared. We're prepared to stand before the Lord. So chapter 4, And the angel who spoke to me came again and awakened me as when a man is awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What did you see? And I said, Behold, I have seen a lampstand made of solid gold and a bowl at its top, and seven lamps upon it, and the seven tubes to its lamps, and over it two olive trees, one on the right of the bowl and one on the left. And I asked the angel who was speaking to me, What are these, my lord? And so he sees a, lamp, a seven-branch lampstand, which was one of the, remember, back in the tabernacle. That was one of the pieces of furniture. And in the temple. So he sees as this vision of a lampstand with two olive trees on either side verse 5 the angel speaking to me answered do you not know what these are and I said no my lord he answered and spoke to me saying this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying 
Not by mighty power, nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Who are you, O great mountain, to set this right before the face of Zerubbabel? For I will bring forth the stone of the inheritance, its grace equaling my grace. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will complete it. And you will know the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. For who has scorned the day of small beginnings? They shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hands of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which look upon all the earth. So, he says first, he says first, remember that lampstand with the seven lamps was kept burning continuously. Right, as a symbol of the presence of presence of the Lord there in the temple and so remember again people are a little scared (laughs) so what's the message of not by might not by power but by my spirit says the Lord meaning what you're going to accomplish here rebuilding the temple rebuilding the city you're not going to do this by being a great king right by defeating all your enemies all around you right it's my presence with you, my spirit among you, that's going to allow you to accomplish this. Right? And that's what that lampstand symbolizes. Now again, I'm jumping forward to Revelation again, but we're going to see Revelation, is in the book of Revelation, in St. John's vision, he's going to see seven lampstands for the seven churches, which is the presence of the spirit, it's the presence of Christ in their midst. And there are a couple of those churches who... He's going to send letters to where Christ is going to say, I'm going to remove my lampstand. I'm going to leave. My presence is going to leave if you don't change what you're doing. So this is another symbol that St. John picks up in the book of Revelation. This symbol of the presence of God in their midst. So verse 11, And I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? And I inquired a second time and said to him, What are the two branches of the olive trees and the handles of the two golden tubes that pour forth and bring oil to the golden channels? And he said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. And he said, These are the two sons of richness who stand beside the Lord of all the earth. (laughs) Who's that? That's Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest. Those are the two olive trees. What's the job of a tree? Bear fruit. fruit. (laughs) Right? And that's how you judge the tree, right? By what fruit it bears at the end of the day. Whether it's a good tree or not. Chapter 5, I turned and looked up and behold a flying sickle. I hope he ducked. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see a flying sickle, 20 cubits in length by 10 cubits wide. And he said to me, this is the curse going out over the face of the whole earth. For every thief on this side shall be punished with death. And everyone on that side who swears falsely shall be punished by death. And I will bring it forth, says the Lord Almighty, and it shall enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. It shall settle in the midst of his house and destroy it, both its timber and its stones. Now this, or this is the image, this is another image of the judgment, and this is one that Christ is going to refer to all the time. He's going to refer to the judgment as a harvest. Right? There's a harvest coming. He sent forth the angels, he sent forth his servants. They're going to harvest the crops, and the good wheat right, is going to be taken, separated out, taken to the barn, and everything else is going to be burned. And so this is the image of that judgment, this sickle. Right, is already going out to harvest. Right, in this case, it's cutting off the heads of, <laughs> of the thieves and, and those who take false oaths. Verse 5, And the angel who was talking to me came out and said to me, Look up and see this that is going forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is the measuring basket that goes forth. And he said, This is their wrongdoing in all the land. And behold, a talent of lead was being lifted up. And behold, one woman sat in the midst of the measuring basket. And he said, this is lawlessness. And he threw it into the midst of the measure. And he threw the lead weight into the mouth of it. 
Then I looked up to see, and behold, two women going forth, and the wind was in their wings. They had wings like the wings of a stork, and they took up the measuring basket into the air between heaven and earth. And I asked the angel speaking to me, For what reason do they carry this basket for measuring? And he said to me, To prepare and to build a place for it in the land of Babylon. They will place it there upon its own place. So the idea here is judgment's about to come for Babylon. <laughs> right? The Babylonian Empire itself has fallen. <laughs> right? But but upon the city and upon the Persian Empire and Babylon here, remember the perspective we're looking from. Right? We've already seen Jerusalem not referring to physical Jerusalem at any given point, right? It's the Jerusalem of God, the capital of his kingdom. What does that make Babylon, right? Technically, the Babylonian Empire has fallen, but what does Bab Babylon symbolize? Evil. Right? It's the capital of the other kingdom, right? Tower of Babel. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right there from the beginning. And so we're going to see... We're going to see this symbolism in other apocalyptic literature where we get into the New Testament and even in the Old Testament where there's Jerusalem and Babylon not necessarily referring to the physical cities, right? But as a contrast, we talked about how Cain builds the first city, right? This idea of sort of the city of man and the city of God as St. Augustine describes it later. And so since that judgment is being prepared... Right, the image here is that justice. Right, we have the we have the balance scales. Right, and so they're talking about the sins of Babylon. Right, the sins of this world, and what's piled into the basket to throw on here? A talent of lead. <laughs> Right? So a big lead weight, right? These are the personal things. They're all put into the basket. The idea being the heaviness, right? The heaviness of the judgment that's going to come upon that's going to come upon the world. Well, I thought we would get farther than we did. But I think this is a good point to stop in Zechariah, since we're going to have to stop in Zechariah. <laughs> so um, We'll stop here. I'm pretty confident that next time, which will not be next week, next week we have the Golden Parishioners Fair. So two weeks. Two weeks, I'm fairly confident we will finish Zechariah and do Malachi, because Malachi is only three chapters. <laughs> so, uh, will we finish with the book? Well, we'll see. It'll depend on what time it is at that hour. But so thank you, everybody, thank you. for your time and attention. <laughs> Um, well, then you'll be even more confused when we eventually get to the book of Revelation. Because, <laughs> because this really, this and Daniel and Ezekiel, as we'll see, really lay the groundwork. If you want to understand what's going on in Revelation, the imagery is, this is where it's coming from. All right, so if you understand what different things represent here in Zechariah, then when St. John refers to them, it's less weird. <laughs> so, so thanks again. So I'll probably see you all before then, but in two weeks we'll have another. <laughs> Lord willing.